This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 191. Today, I'm gonna share with you some news from Google Cloud Platform and AWS, Docker straight from DockerCon, share a few picks, and we're also gonna interview Mark Rackley about client-side development. Recorded live April the 25th, 2017. While many IT teams struggle with the impact of deploying Office 365, Zscaler customers are experiencing 40% or greater network performance across file download times, as well as TCP and DNS connection times, compared to using next-gen firewalls and UTMs to route Office 365 traffic locally to the internet. While you may know Zscaler as the leader in cloud security, they also have hundreds of customers who are processing over 1.2 petabytes of Office 365 traffic monthly through the Zscaler cloud. Visit www.zscaler.com to learn more. Hello, loyal listeners. This is AC today. I'm flying solo because CJ is off with his wife vacationing in Italy on their 10-year anniversary. So just going to give a nice little hat tip to him and give him the week off. I've been watching the pictures coming across from Italy, and they are staying in definitely a beautiful place. His wife, Vicky, did a great job planning out that vacation. So it looks awesome. Glad CJ's enjoying some time off, but we have to have a little bit of fun at his expense. I got some news I want to share with you today. Got a few other things I want to kind of go over. I also sat down with Mark Rackley uh, back at the SP TechCon conference in Austin, Texas, where we met, I guess it was early or the first week of April, and we talked a little bit about client-side development. So that's going to be the meat of this episode today. But before we dive into that, what I would like to do, though, is share a little bit of stuff. First, we're going to have a little bit of fun at CJ's expense and tell a little story about CJ and I. Back in 2012, I guess. Yeah, I think it was 2012. CJ and I, along with two friends, uh, Jeremy Thake and Ryan Dugood, we all were at the SharePoint conference in Las Vegas. This is back in 2012, 2012. And uh, CJ was the main guy kind of running the show at the conference. And so he was pretty slammed at the the SharePoint conference that week. And uh, I think this was also back in the time uh, Jeremy was still working for AvPoint and Ryan Duguid was at Nintex at the time. And so we all did the conference like you know normally do during the week. But then immediately after the conference, we the four of us had tickets to go see the Formula One race in Austin, Texas. And we were going to all fly straight from Vegas over to uh, Austin. And, uh, you know, last night of the conference, a lot of companies do big parties and all that kind of stuff. So we actually, all four of us kind of split up and went our own ways. Um, Ryan was doing some stuff with Nintex. Jeremy was off doing some stuff. I was off doing some MVP and speaker stuff and then kind of went off and did my thing with some friends. And CJ was off with the uh, the staff from the conference having a whole bunch of fun. And the idea was, is we were all supposed to meet up the next morning and catch a car and head to the airport. Well, you know, as everything happens in Vegas, uh, some people actually stayed in Vegas and didn't make the flight with us. CJ and I linked up sometime around, I, well, I guess it was, it was pretty early. We, let's just say that we were all been up all night having a good time. And I think we met up around, uh, breakfast. <laughs> so, uh, CJ and I met up, we got the car. Uh, We went looking for Jeremy, couldn't find Jeremy. He was supposed to meet up with us, tried to find Ryan, couldn't find Ryan. Um, We were all supposed to be, I think, on the same flight. Some people didn't and make our flights. CJ and I made it to Austin. Jeremy came in about an hour or so later, Ryan after that as well. But the funny part of the story was uh, CJ and I jumped in a car, in a, a town car, heading to the airport from Mandalay Bay. And our driver proceeds to pull out his phone and start saying, hey, next time that you're in Vegas, if you're looking to have some fun in Vegas, make sure you, you know, use my card and give me a call and I'll pick you up and bring you guys in from the airport. So we're like, okay, cool. Well, then he shows us his phone and his iPad. And let's just say he had something a little bit more in mind than what CJ and I thought we just meant just getting uh, transportation from the airport to the hotel. Very questionable establishments and individuals. So it was um, quite entertaining. We got out of the car and just were laughing our butts off. But at any rate, there's your there's your funny CJ story for the week. Hey, so I've got a, a bunch of links here. Last week was uh, DockerCon in Austin, Texas. This is where Docker holds their annual conference to share all the new stuff that's going on. But before I do that, I want to go over a little bit of news that we've had from Office 365, Google Cloud Platform, and AWS. 
Then we'll talk a little bit about DockerCon and some of the big news that came from there. And finally, I'll do the interview uh, with Mark Rackley so we can hear how um, a little bit about client-side development in my discussion with Mark. Finally, we'll wrap it up with some picks that I have. So you're not going to miss your picks just because CJ is uh, lounging around in Italy. But before we do that, let's hear, have one of our words from one of our great sponsors. What if you could take any process your teams use to get work done and make it happen automatically? What if you could save countless hours and help people work better together? Nintex can make that happen. With the Nintex platform, work flows from person to person, system to system, to the cloud and back. And it flows in and out of the tools that you use every day. With Nintex, work flows so your teams can work smarter, work faster, and be more connected than ever. All right, so we're going to kick it off here with some news from Office 365. The first one I have here is from the Office 365, the Office Dev Center, about Delta Query. And so now we have Delta Query available for users, groups, messages, calendar, and more. This is now available in preview. Um, what this is, is this is an extension to the, or not an extension, this is an additional feature to the Microsoft Graph that is going to allow people to, or applications, to discover newly updated or created and deleted resources and relationships without having to perform a full read with every request. What it does is it also provides change tracking for relationships between these entities, like changes to a user's manager or the group membership updates. This capability may sound familiar, but it is that what Microsoft is doing is they're adding more and more support for Delta Query for additional resources. So I'll have a link in the show notes to the post where you can actually see how this works and uh, what you have to do to make it uh, work. Generally, what happens is you're going to make a request. You add to slash delta to the end of a standard get request. And what it's going to do is give you the normal response that you would normally see. But once you go through all the pages of all the data using the next link, you'll finally get a delta link at the very end. And that's got a little change token in there that will know that you've already looked at all the data up to that point, and you really want to see changes that happen from that point forward. The next thing is from the Office Dev Center is the general availability of the Office 365 CDN. So the CDN, Content Delivery Network, this is a public CDN from Office 365 that makes it a little bit easier for you to leverage a CDN with your Office 365 assets that you create. So essentially what it does is an administrator is first going to enable this 365 public CDN for a tenant using the SharePoint online management shell. And then any static assets that you want to be shared on the CDN are uploaded to specific SharePoint libraries, which are really enabled as CDN origins. And the assets that are being exposed from these different libraries and folders, they'll be able to be accessible from the CDN URLs. The URLs that are pointed to the CDN location are available to be used in the SharePoint sites and SharePoint customizations that are hosted in SharePoint. So this is a really useful thing when you come into taking a look at things like with um, the uh, SharePoint framework, uh, having customizations you want to deploy the SharePoint framework. Um, the post also talks about uh, the private CDN capabilities that you have with publishing auto rewriting capabilities. So uh, I'll just kind of leave a link to this in the show notes where you can see additional details about this. Also includes a few new PowerShell commandlets for managing your CDN and a video on uh, uh, the patterns and practices stuff on where you can see this as well. And then the last bit of Office 365 related news here is a post on the SharePoint blog by Chris McNulty at Microsoft, which is about SharePoint modern list and library web parts. What their Microsoft is doing is they are shipping in a preview mode, and it's going to start over the next few weeks uh, and first go out to the first release users that will allow you to use on a modern page uh, lists and library web parts to be able to see the data from those different items. Previously, you were only able to see the lists and libraries in a modern page on the default page for each list or library. The first editions of these new web parts are going to allow you to also embed custom views to a, of a list or a library to a modern SharePoint page alongside the previously released web parts like text, image, or embed. So that's two new, couple new things here that we have that are not only introduced in preview, the Delta Query and the modern list and library web parts, but also something that's coming more into uh, general availability or, or uh, I guess a V1 release, which is the Office 365 CDN. There are two bits of news here that I have that I'll just categorize as the other clouds, which are um, the Google Cloud Platform and AWS. 
AWS announced uh, recently that their EC2 F1 instances are now generally available. So what's special about these F1 instances? Well, as you would imagine, as the race fan that I am, F1 means fast. Well, these are the, the AWS EC2 instances, the virtual machines, that have the field programmable gate arrays, uh, the FPGA cards uh, installed in them. So these are now available for us to play with if you're an AWS customer. So it'll be interesting to see how Microsoft responds to this with their FPGAs and when they're going to be available for customers to start playing with as well. Again, links to this will be in the show notes. As far as the Google Cloud platform, the Google Container Engine, the GKE, is actually spelled with a K because it stands for Kubernetes, they have expanded their support or updated the Google Container Engine to now make Kubernetes 1.6 available to GKE customers. There's a lot of additional updates to uh, 1.6. It's been out for a little while. What's new is that it's actually available inside of uh, the Google Container Engine, the hosted version of Kubernetes from the Google Cloud Platform. The big thing that this is going to add to us, big, you know, a couple, three big things that we have here, is it's going to increase in number the supported nodes by two and a half times. It, we're going up from 2,000 nodes all the way up to 5,000 supported nodes. It's also adding fully managed nodes. What this is doing is adding the the option to fully manage your Kubernetes nodes uh, to have full control of them. You can also have auto upgrade and auto repair. So you can optionally have Google automate your update, automatically update your cluster to the newest version. So you don't have to worry about which version of Kubernetes you're running on. And it's also going to introduce the general availability of a container optimized operating system. So, GKE was originally designed to be a secure and reliable way to run Kubernetes. And by using the Container Optimized OS, you have a lockdown operating system that was specifically designed for running containers on the Google Cloud. So those are my two bits of news from GCP and AWS. Now, before I go too much further here with the any more news, I'd like to just stop and uh, give a little shout out to one of our sponsors. They're the ones that make this show possible. So if you would, just please make sure that you uh, call those guys out when in your tweets or something, just saying, hey, thanks for sponsoring the podcast. ShareGate makes it easier for organization to adopt and use the latest Microsoft productivity tools, helping millions of users be happier and more productive at work. ShareGate is trusted by over 10,000 IT admins from over 110 countries to manage, migrate, and secure their SharePoint and Office 5 environments. ShareGate is recognized as the must-have tool for day-to-day administration of on-premises, cloud, and hybrid environments. Interested in learning more? Check us out at ShareGate.com to learn how ShareGate can make you more productive. All right. So the next bit of things that I want to cover here are going to be related to DockerCon. So what do we have come out of DockerCon? Uh, They had a few really interesting things that, that they announced at DockerCon I didn't think that there was a ton of announcements that came out of this, but there were some really nice ones that did come out. I'll have links in the show notes to the DockerCon 2017 YouTube playlist so you can see all the sessions that they recorded and they'll be publishing up to their YouTube channel. As of the day I'm recording this, that's Tuesday, April the 25th, there's not much stuff in there right now. There's the general session from day one and day two, and then there's a cool hack session. It's called the Moby's Cool Hack Session. I'll explain what Moby is in just a minute. So right now, that's about, let's see, I'm looking at it, maybe one, two, three, almost four hours of content between those three videos. But they'll have breakout sessions posted there as well. Um, usually it takes a few days for those to get posted. So maybe by the time the show comes out. So what's the big news coming out of DockerCon? One of the biggest things, there's, there's two really big things that popped out. And one of them is around something called the Moby Project. So the Moby project was announced at DockerCon. And what this is, it, they, they say it's a new open source project to advance the software containerization movement and to help the ecosystem take containers mainstream. So the Moby project is going to provide a library of components and a framework for assembling them into custom container-based systems and a place for all container enthusiasts to experiment and exchange ideas. I'll have a link to the Moby project and the blog post that talks about it in the show notes. Effectively, though, what I think that this is, from what I can tell, is that Moby is essentially the core bit of Docker. And then what Docker has done is Docker, the company, has then created, we talked about this a couple weeks ago on the show, 
They've created two other offerings, Docker Community Edition and Docker Enterprise Edition. Those are based on Docker. So you used to have Docker, Docker Community Edition, and Docker Enterprise Edition. Community Edition's free. And what they've done now is they've simply renamed the Docker project to Moby. In fact, that's exactly what happened. If you go look at the the repo, if you went to docker slash docker on GitHub, you went to github.com slash docker for the organization and then slash docker, that actually redirects you over to Moby. So that's now the core container code base is all coming from this open source project that other companies could use to implement their own thing and that Docker is just the steward of. So that's one big announcement. Another very big announcement that was pretty big, it was, it was heralded quite a bit, is something called Linux Kit. Now, this is really interesting. So what Linux Kit is, it's a new component that's bringing Linux container functionality to new and varied platforms from IoT to mainframes. So what this is, it's called Linux Kit. It includes tooling to allow building custom Linux subsystems that not only include exactly the components that the runtime platform requires, sorry, that they only re- include those components that the runtime requires. All the system services in Linux, they're actually containers. So you can replace them and you can remove them and only include the stuff that you really need. All the components can be substituted with ones, substituted with ones that match specific needs. And like I said, it's a kit. It's very much you know, following the Docker philosophy that is always, you know, batteries are included, but you can always swap them out. I'll have a link to the, in the show notes to this. There were some interesting demos and discussion around this with Microsoft. And, you know, now, like, I guess the big question that, uh, that a, a lot of people had when they saw this, you know, what Linux kit's going to allow you to do is, you know, it allows you to, it, it really is setting the stage to uh, make it very easy to deploy heterogeneous applications without having to worry about where they're running. You know, like in the past, when you worked on in a container based system, you had the ability to have different pieces of your container engine be swappable from the orchestrator to DNS to networking, stuff like that. What this did, you know, about two years ago, Microsoft is a big piece to this. Docker started to offer the ability to run containerized Windows apps inside on Windows boxes. And earlier this year, Docker also offered the ability to mix and match to run a Linux container with a front-end framework and Windows containers with a back-end SQL environment or, or vice versa. The challenge was is that, you know, while you could do that, each in its own container, each one still had to run on separate hosts. So like, the Linux one had to be run on a Linux host. The Windows one had to already run on a Windows host. And so the administrator still had to worry about which containers could run on which hosts. Linux kit may make that worry evaporate. It's not intended to be a replacement for a full-featured operating system. It's really building a very minimal OS for container environments. So Docker's already deployed Linux Kit for some of its enterprise editions. Those are for Windows and Mac and AWS and Azure. Microsoft is even using Linux Kit to deliver minimal hardened Linux capabilities inside Hyper-V secured containers. So now the next step is, is you know, are we going to have a Windows subsystem for Linux to be able to have to do that same kind of a thing? We have a Linux subsystem for Windows, but are we going to get a Windows subsystem for Linux? And that will really allow us to do you know, maybe portable containers based on whatever host they're architected on top of, and they could run anywhere, either on a Linux machine or Mac machine or, or Windows machine. As one email that I saw get sent around, I guess said right at this point, all the open source eyes are now looking at Microsoft to see what they're going to do with this. So maybe it's too soon, maybe not. Maybe we'll see them say something about this at the Build Conference coming up in a few weeks. Now, the last thing that, that I thought was uh, worth mentioning here from DockerCon is a modernization of traditional apps program. What this is, it's, is, is a program that's been designed to help enterprises make their existing legacy apps more secure and efficient and portable to hybrid cloud infrastructure. It was collaborative, this program is collaboratively developed and brought to market with partners like Avanade, Cisco, HPE, uh, which is Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and Microsoft. It consists of consulting services, Docker Enterprise Edition, and cloud infrastructure, a hybrid cloud infrastructure from partners to monetize existing .NET, Windows, or Java Linux applications in five days or less. I'll have a link to this in the show notes. Talks a little bit about how you can go about doing this, what the certification program looks like, 
and all of that stuff. It's pretty interesting on um, you know how you can modernize existing legacy applications without having to modify any source code or re-architecting the application. So some pretty cool stuff to go take a look at there. Okay, now we've covered all the news that I wanted to cover here. And now I want to transition over and switch over to my interview that I did with Mark Rackley a couple weeks ago. Mark is a, uh, a fantastic developer who really lives a lot these days in the client side space. And, and there's been a lot of debate, you know, or discussion about this concept of things like, you know, citizen developer and pro developers. And if you do server side code, are you a pro developer? And if you're a JavaScript guy, are you really not a real developer and all that kind of stuff? Something that Mark and I have been wanting to talk about on the show, and we happen to spend some time together. Well, we spent a lot of time together, actually. We spent a week together in Redmond at the um, SharePoint Dev Kitchen, and then we went straight to Austin, Texas to uh, for the SP TechCon conference, where we were interrupted by a tornado at the hotel, and even our travel, our trip getting there were, was uh, even challenging. Our flight from Seattle to Salt Lake was Somebody got very, very sick in Mark's aisle. Thankfully, Mark was not affected by it, aside from having to stand up while there was a significant cleanup having to happen. But, oh, man, that's not fun on a plane. Anyway, I'm going to play this interview for you right now. I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on it. If you would, just you know, send us some feedback. Let us know what you think. And, um, yeah, I'd love to, love to hear what you think. And make sure you stick around for the end of the interview because i got a couple but three different picks that I want to share with you and also some other interesting stuff. Actually, before we play the interview, though, it's always worth mentioning that we need we have some great sponsors, and so I'm going to take another second here to have one of our sponsors uh, have a moment to say a few words to you. If you would, again, please make sure you support our sponsors. They're the ones that make this show possible for CJ and I to bring it to you. The Microsoft Cloud Show is sponsored by Valid.nl. Valid's motto is stay ahead. Its mission is to enable its customers to excel in their business through the innovative use of IT. Valid is always on the lookout for new colleagues. Are you interested in all things happening in Azure, whether in infrastructure, SQL Server, Office 365, BI, SharePoint, or .NET? Look them up on valid.nl. And this is Andrew. I am sitting here with Mark Rackley. We are both here in Austin, Texas at the SP TechCon conference in early April. And uh, finally, we're able to sit down and to link up and have a conversation about some JavaScript or client-side development and customization stuff that you and I have, we've been going back and forth wanting to do this for a couple months now, I think. Huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> How are you doing, Mark? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> 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 yeah, so we, this was spurred about by, I guess you had a conversation with Richard Dezerga on the Office 365 Developer Podcast, and I listened to the episode, absolutely loved it, and there were some things that I kind of wanted to go a little bit deeper with you and talk a bit more about it and to get your perspective on it because I think that you know, the style of customization and changes that you do inside of SharePoint, a lot of people, I think there's a lot of developers that look at it and kind of go like, ah, that's not stuff that I would do or something like that, but it's, I mean, you, you can provide like business value pretty instantly and it's very big demand with a lot of customers, especially with a lot of the challenges that we've run into with the different ways that we can deploy stuff with SharePoint. So, I mean, your, your solutions, I think, are, are, it's a very viable one. But this really isn't, I mean, it, this isn't a SharePoint thing, right? This is a, this, the stuff that you do. And you describe a little bit about what you do, I guess, when we start there. Right. So what I'm doing, and, I, and I've said this a few times now, but I started back with SharePoint 2007, actually. We are creating functionality by writing scripts and somehow getting that script injected into a page in SharePoint. Right? SharePoint just happens to be the context that the script is running in. So that same technology, it's, it's not... I've done the same thing to my WordPress site, right? You can do it in any web technology, basically, right? I, well, I'm sure there's some you can't, but yeah. for the most part, think of it, if this customizations we're doing, you could do in any web platform whatsoever, where you're creating script, you're manipulating the DOM to make a, to change the layout, you're adding business logic to forms, you're... You're adding the things like the animations that everybody likes because they like the stupid animations all the time. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's it's nothing that's too record breaking or or uh, you know that no one's doing anywhere else. But yeah, I do it a lot in the SharePoint space. So in the SharePoint space, I mean, what kinds of like tools are you using? You're a jQuery guy, is that correct? jQuery is the main library I use, um, and basically because it's what I got started with. I'm the type of guy once I find something that works for me, if, and I become proficient in it, you really need to convince me to get away from it because. Sure. It works well, it's supported, it's used everywhere. There's jQuery libraries 
all over the place to do all sorts of animations and content sliders and all that stuff. So by using jQuery, it kind of opens up all that world to me. Okay. And it's pretty lightweight. It's just a utility library, so I'm not doing like it extensive framework or anything. It's just something nice and simple that gets me going. Cool. Yeah, I want to talk to you a little bit about the framework side um, in just a minute, but I want to ask you, like, so how do you get your stuff onto the SharePoint pages today? Like, what's your workflow look like? So you've, you've gone through and, actually, let me do this. Let's back up a bit. You sit down and start building a solution, right? So what tools are you using to build that solution to test it, iterative development and everything? What are you doing in your SharePoint environment that you're building it out for the customer? So, you know, and this is going to make a lot of enterprise devs cringe. Yeah, no, yeah this is a, yeah, yeah, yeah that's why I'm doing this. Because that's, that's, that's kind of one of the, the downsides of it we can get into if you talk about the downsides of what I do. Sure. But essentially, my development tool is code, Visual Studio Code, because I need an IDE to write the scripts in. Editor. Not an IDE. Sorry, Edward. <laughs> IDE's got lots of tool windows and, and wizards and all that crap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we can edit that part out, my stupidity. But, uh, no, 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 man. This is, this is why we wanted to do this. Okay. So I use uh, Visual Studio Code or even Notepad, right? Whatever. But um, So I write my scripts in there. I will put those scripts into a document library in SharePoint, and then I'll add that script to a page in SharePoint by either using a... Uh, um, a content editor web part linked to that script, sometimes a script editor web part, uh, and then very occasionally if it's something I needed to deploy across a site collection or a site, I use something like a custom action uh, to do that as a sandbox solution. Okay, all right, so you're using some of the existing tools we have out there for script editor, content editor, or sandbox solution to get it. What, when, when you go to deploy it to your customer and everything, what like how what does your deployment story look like for your customer? Do you are you like are you the one that's deploying it? Are you usually handing it over? If you're handing it over, what does that artifact look like? Are you is it manual steps? Do you have a script that actually installs this stuff? What what's that look like? So it really depends on the client, right? Uh, at Paint Group, we specialize in the small and medium sized clients, mm -hmm. and a lot of these customizations we do are one time customizations. And I think that's very important to this type of development that. I'm typically not building a solution that you're going to deploy to 100 sites, right? It's typically, this is something specific to the marketing site. Yeah. This is something specific for this one instance. So that deployment process is typically us deploying it, which you move. If it's something we're doing manually, we would do it manually. We'll go ahead and we'll add the scripts to the correct document library. We'll add the web parts. We'll do any configuration, get it going. We'll document what we did so they can maintain it easily. If they want it more deployable, we can do this whole thing as a sandbox solution. So using sandbox solutions, you can actually deploy those scripts uh, and, and automate some of that. Uh, purpose to you. And if you're on premises, you have more options there as well. Sure. Like we have a client that we wrote a PowerShell script for, and that PowerShell script actually deployed the script, added the content editor web part, and then did the linking of the, the content editor web part to the script. So they just so had you to can run. automate it. Yeah, yes. you can run the PowerShell script. Oh, okay, so they it. just ran a posh script to go through to knock the whole thing out and deploy it. So that, right. that's good. It's just there's a lot of options there. Sure, sure. So what would you say? I mean, you mentioned a second ago. One of the one of the observations I have about this style of stuff. I mean, I've done this. I've done this too. It's you know, it's really whatever to get the business style to work. Let me back up a bit. One of the things you know, the style of development you do. I know a lot of enterprise. Well, I don't really want to call them enterprise devs. We we're going to talk about this in just a second about this whole concept of citizen developer and pro dev and enterprise whatever. Okay. But I know that let's just say someone that I, that fits that I fit the model of a little bit where I'm a little bit more of someone who likes the structured approach of you know source control and I like to go through and to push in uh, do have testing and automated deployments and CI and CD and all that stuff. I know that there's there's a lot of people that kind of fit my camp and they look at the stuff that you're doing and they're like going ah it's not a good way to do it and all that kind of stuff which I mean. I I don't. I don't particularly care for that attitude because you're, we're both getting something done, right? And it's whatever the customer wants. Whatever it's, you know, it's whatever we're going to guide them in the right direction, and we're going to do what, we're going to do what's going to go through and solve the problem. So, what you mentioned a little bit about, like you know, what the, the some of the advantages here is low friction, is easy to kind of roll this stuff out and everything. But do you have would, do you have any disadvantages that you see from this stuff when when you're doing it? Well, yeah. So I think you brought a couple of those up, right? Because of this whole process. You do have to figure out what is your source code control story going to be. If you're not using Visual Studio tied to TFS, maybe using GitHub or using Git. But we, we use Git for our source code control, and we can uh, we can 
connect that up and easily store our, our source code with using the Git tools out there, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the way to do that. But when you're talking, we go again towards that enterprise where I, I use enterprise to think of those really large corporations where they've got these dedicated developers on a team writing code together and they've got to deploy functionality out to thousands of sites and they've got to automate that deployment to thousands of sites. That's when this type of development can be problematic because if you're doing everything in a document library as a content editor way part on a page, you've got five developers working on that script. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. How are you going to stop from colliding with each other? I mean, what's the deployment going to look like when you have to repeat that deployment a thousand times? Right. That's not a great story. So I can understand how some of those developers look at this and say, well, what's this isn't maintainable for us. Yeah. And I get that. I absolutely, totally get that. To be fair, you can make it that way. You can say to where you use your content editor web part instead of referencing a script that's inside of a document library or site assets or something. Instead, you're referencing it on a CDN. Right. You're referencing it on a, on, a, on a blob somewhere. And as part of your deployment process, then you can actually, this is actually what I'm doing with, with some of the stuff with one of the sites I'm working with where I'm building stuff using TypeScript locally. I compile it down to JavaScript, minify it and everything using Gulp task. And then I have a thing that actually pushes it out to an Azure storage blob. And I, I purge the old one from the CDN and update and, and reload it into the blob, all using the Azure REST APIs. And I do it all as an automated thing. I mean, it's all part of Gulp task and everything. And when I push it up to, to uh, GitHub, my dev branch, Circle kicks in, runs, and everything. So I'm, I'm doing the same thing. I, you know, I'm actually using jQuery too with this whole thing too. So wise man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we mentioned, we, we touched on it a second ago. This concept of, I really hate this this thing. I'm just gonna, I want to go out and say that first because I, I, I really hate it when someone sits down and they 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 label you as like a citizen developer. And I know, you know, last week we were all together doing some stuff and. There was this debate about, you know, is that really the right term? And of course, someone went out and found out it's a uh, real term on Gartner. And you can tell that it, it's Gartner defines it as uh, someone within like an organization who has taken the tools that they're given. Maybe it's Excel, maybe it's a text, maybe it's a content editor web part, maybe it's a script editor or something like that. And they're taking the tools that they have to get the things done that need to get done. I think it's a, I don't like the description because it's pretty generic because that's what I do. And I don't call myself a citizen developer. Right. I mean, there's nothing different there. So I think that they label you as like a citizen developer and they label me as like a pro developer. And I'm curious to get your thoughts on both the term citizen developer and kind of where this thing fits before I share, like I'll share what my thoughts are, but I want, I want you to have the opportunity to say what you want, wanted to say to this thing first. I think the term citizen developer, I don't care if Gartner said it, right? It's like, it doesn't make it right. I think it's, it's, it's deceptive in this terminology. I think that there are a lot of developers out there who are labeled citizen developer, and that's almost like you're not a pro developer. I call them citizen developer. And you've got people out there who don't know how to write a line of code to save their life because they are just using some other tool to do the job. And they may be building something, but they're not a developer in the traditional sense. So I think it's a very confusing term. Yeah. I had two people call me a citizen developer last week when we were up in, uh, uh, in Microsoft doing the dev kitchen stuff. Yep. And, you know, I have a degree in computer engineering, right? I I used to write .NET web parts all the time in, this, in event receivers. I'm sorry. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I like it. I like C Sharp. Yeah. I like compiled code. I like a compiler tell me what I broke. Yeah. I enjoy all that. That's not where the money is right now, right? So I have hooked my wagon to this JavaScript and client-side dev stuff because I, I'm decent at it. Uh, we have just a big demand from our clients for it. And we can develop and deploy solutions for them much more rapidly than we can if we do something more managed like the add-in model, right? Yep. Which, I'm sorry, if I put down a statement of work in front of a client and I say, hey, if I use a content editor web part, it'll cost you this much. If I do a SharePoint add-in, it's going to cost you this much. Which one are you going to pick? Yeah. Right? They're going to pick the content editor web part every single time. Yeah. I'm with you. I don't like the term because I think it's... I get what Gartner says about it. To me, it feels a little demeaning in the description of it because when you try and classify different kinds of developers, and I mean, we're doing, you and I are doing a lot of air quotes here and a lot of stuff with our hands, which is kind of hard to see on a podcast. But, you know, to me, when you say citizen developer, you kind of put someone like at one level, right? And then when you say, no, this person's a pro developer, then to me, it kind of implies that that person is like at a higher level in terms of a more senior or more experienced or something like that. And I don't see that, you know, if I'm sitting there and doing something with like C Sharp or I'm doing something with like Visual Studio or I've got an automated build process and I'm testing and all that stuff, I don't see what I'm doing to be at any different of a level than what somebody is doing with jQuery is doing some of the content or web part and everything. It's really just 
two different tools and two different two different models. Right. So I know we we looked at different things. What do you call it? And we were joking around with the term master builder coming from Lego. He's, it's like you know, I can go through and I can build anything with what's available to me. And because if you look at the generic description of citizen developer, that's what it is too. But yeah, I mean, it's just a. I think that there's. I get really irritated with the people who have this stigma of just saying no, no, no. This isn't the right kind of. It's not the same kind of a thing. Are you going to put citizen developer on your resume? Have you ever no. seen citizen developer on your resume? No. But stop using the term. I'm right? productive. It's it's you're, you're productive. Yeah, I see. I would say I'm productive. Like, oh, I yeah. see you as a developer. I see me as a developer. Right. And right. we're both getting stuff done. What tools do you use? I mean, just so like for instance, I know you know Eric Shops, good friend of ours, is much more of a fan of Visual Studio, TFS, that whole model for, inter for, for enterprises and stuff, where I'm much more a fan of using Visual Studio Code and using Jasmine and using dot, uh, for testing and Mocha to run my tests and JavaScript, doing my stuff with JavaScript or TypeScript. I'm much more a fan of that. Does that make what he does any different than what I'm doing? No. And would you put us at the different level? No, I wouldn't. I'd, I'd keep us all the same thing. It's just the different tools and stuff that you end up using. Absolutely. So... We touched on a little. We talked a little bit about jQuery, and you mentioned you dropped the web framework a little nugget in there a second ago. I wouldn't call JavaScript or jQuery a, a web framework. Yeah. What about what would you like? What would, it, to me is more of a it's a utility belt, right? Right. It's a utility library. It's yeah. Just JavaScript. So these different web frameworks that are out there, you've got the things like React, you've got the things like No, we got Angular, you've got Aurelia, you've got Vue.js and 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 Knockout. What's your take on all this stuff? I mean, do you have, what's your take on just generally looking at a web framework and then maybe trying to go a little bit farther and just talking about like data binding and a view library and all that kind of stuff that it services that it gives you and such? Well, this is going to go to a whole other argument that, that I know that I think uh, Tipper called you out for actually last week. <laughs> and that's where, you know, what is SharePoint? Because it goes, it goes back to SharePoint because I'm doing my development in SharePoint. Yep. And do you consider SharePoint a platform or you consider it an API, right? I consider SharePoint a platform. Okay. I like to let SharePoint do everything it wants to do. It's going to do my data storage. It's going to do my approval workflows. It's going to do my authentication. I'm going to let it take care of its thing and do it really well because that gets me 85% of the way there when I'm developing a business solution for a client. Mm -hmm. And then I can take my script, my, my content editor web part, and I can get that extra 15%. But because I'm just letting SharePoint do most of the work, my scripts are only 300 lines long, right? They're, they're relatively small scripts. You don't have to worry about authentication or anything. It's just let all right. the infrastructure take care of it for you. Exactly. I'm in the context of SharePoint. I don't have to do anything with authentication. Let's just run it, those 300 lines of script. And in that scenario, nine times out of ten, any framework is overkill, mm. right? Because you've got all this upfront work that is going to completely increase the bloat of your solution. It could slow it down if you choose the wrong framework, and you're going to spend a lot more time just getting all the pieces in place uh, when you could be done in you know in an hour by just using without using the framework whatsoever because it's such a small piece of functionality. Mm -hmm. Now, I think frameworks really do come in handy if you're working on a large project where you do need a separate layers for your view model and your services and factories and all that stuff you have with like Angular. Mm -hmm. I've actually built an Angular application before to see what it would take to do it. And I'm like, this is a lot of work. Yeah. Why do I want to go through this much work when I can do it so much faster in other ways? So I think if you have in a larger situation where you're working with a development team, mm -hmm. I think frameworks are great for helping isolate what people are working on. Um, it's going to help structure those larger projects so they're easier to debug and maintain. Mm -hmm. Somebody I talked to recently, it might have been Rich, mm -hmm. said that you know if you do go with a framework, you can easily hire someone who knows Angular yeah. or knows React, and they're going to have... You refer to Richard Desergo. Right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. And go you're ahead. going to have a faster up-to-speed time with that new employee because they're going to be familiar with that framework. Right. Right. So I think those are good reasons to use a framework, but I always come to people and say... In a year, it's going to be a new framework, right? Yeah, and I think that, I mean, to me, I think it really depends on... I don't have a preference on saying, you know, do I want to go web framework or do I not want to go web framework? But I think, like, I mean, to me, like what you just described, you have to look at what it's going to, what it's going to provide you. And you look at something like Angular, if I'm building an application and I... Do I need navigation? No. Do I need a logging, a logging service? No. Do I need services and factories to be able to do stuff to abstract and make it more of an MVC style or an MV star model? type of an application. No, I don't need that. And it's like, well, then Angular is over, overboard for you. And you look at some of the other options that are out there, right? So do I just need to go through and maybe do a little bit of manipulation? And I guess the part of, the part of jQuery that I don't like is like a lot of the, the jQuery UI 
components that take a lot of, they create like accordions and they create like the different tab models and all that kind of stuff. Those things to me feel more like they're taking components and they're trying to bolt them onto a utility script where in that sense, if I take something like a React that's much more of a view model that has those web UI components and I can build stuff that I can build a, like a React application that it's not so much like this this tiered model, this MVC model, but I'm just using those kind of components, using them for this the view and such. It's funny when people try and draw comparisons between Angular and React to me because they're two very different things, right? One of them's a view, one of them's just a, a view engine, and the other one is a view, a data model, a service is a factory. It's got a navigation component and routing and stuff like that. We don't really have all that stuff inside of React. You get some of it, but that's not what React's supposed to do. You usually pair React with a couple different things and treat it more like a Chinese menu. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I want a little bit of this, I want a little bit of this. It's almost like React's like eating family style, where to me, going, like going with Angular is kind of like going, we have a set five course meal for you and you're going to do stuff this way. And you can still snap stuff in. You can still get the Brussels sprouts add-on if you want. But you're still kind of more in this like Angular model where React is, let's take things from all over the place. That makes sense. And you know, to be honest, I have not done anything with React yet. But okay. that's going to have to change, obviously. But yeah, I, I think that that's interesting. So I, I learned something there. So you say, you say you're going to have to learn that, obviously. And I think you're alluding to SharePoint framework kind of stuff. Right? I might be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, might, that might be my clever segue. So <laughs> last week, you and I were... You and I were in Redmond. We were there for the developer kitchen, Dev Kitchen 4, where we were kind of talking, having good interactions with the product group, seeing some really, really early bits, but really having more conversations about like, you know, what do we want? What do we not, what do we what do we want from SharePoint? What do we expect them to do, giving them feedback on the stuff that they are doing and telling them what we love and what we don't love of what their plans are, and then giving them our asks as well. And I think that you know one of the messages that we walked away with, both you and I did, along with a bunch of other people, is that just how strongly that you know Microsoft is not just betting on React, but just I wouldn't say they bet on React. What they've done is they've chosen to adopt it, and they adopted it full bore. And so it's not like they're choosing one over; they're not choosing a winner, and they're not saying one's going to win over this one. It's just that here's the way we've gone, and here's all the stuff that we've done to make it work for us and to all the different components, and oh yeah, by the way, you guys can leverage it all too. Right. And so you, you know, I know you and I both walked away like going, well, gotta spend a little more time just paying attention to this. If I wanna be able to reuse the components that they've already built, I can build them myself, but they've already built them. It's not gonna cost me anything. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, what's your, you know, let's, let's pivot a little bit here. Let's talk a little about SharePoint framework. Like, what's okay. your, What's your take on it? I mean, clearly, don't talk about what we saw last week, but... So... <laughs> uh, no. uh, Amazing, we just had to cut out 15 minutes of our interview here. Right. <laughs> so the SharePoint framework, it's, you know, I've... I started touching it last year, playing with it, trying to create some client web parts, and it was, it was pretty brittle. It was pretty brutal and brittle. But I, after using it again last week, and seeing what they're doing, playing with it, it's... I like the progress I'm seeing. I like the fact that things actually worked. Yeah. Um, so that was really great. This is where I'm conflicted, though. Going with the SharePoint framework, you can do the exact same things I do with the, the content editor web part customizations. And what's great about that is you can now do that in a much more controlled environment, right? You can now more easily add those unit tests to it. You can now, instead of having your users have to tweak a script, you can create a web part property that they can easily update, so you can keep them out of the script. You can even turn scripting off on your tenant now, and just you know, because once you upload that app, you can still use it. So there's a lot of great features that I think they're really needed that you get with the SharePoint framework. However, it's clearly not made for those quote unquote citizen developers. <laughs> Here we go again. Right. I, don't, I mean, again, I hate that term, but. You know what? This SharePoint framework is going, to sell, is going to separate those citizen developers from the other developers because if you don't know how to write code, you're not going to be using the SharePoint framework. Well, let me ask you this. How hard... I mean, clearly there's a learning curve. There's a, there's a learning curve to trying to learn, you know, how am I supposed to work within the bounds that they give me, right? But how hard did you find it to take the stuff that you normally do? Because that's all what you build. I mean, you use... You did something with SharePoint Framework. You took some of the new stuff that they gave us, but you were still using jQuery. You yep. were still using some of your jQuery UI components and stuff. Yep. But how hard did you find it? Well, I sat next to you, so I know how hard you found it. <laughs> I know some of the things that tripped you up and everything, but how hard did you find it now that you've done one? I mean, or not just one. I know you've done other stuff before as well, but now that you've done one or two, a couple things with the SharePoint Framework, 
and you kind of have an idea of where it's going and everything, how hard did you find it, it was to take what you would normally do, like say in a content or web part, and to be able to, to implement that in, in a SharePoint framework, client side web part, and enroll that out? So is that question... Is that question, how hard is it for me to do it? Or how hard is it for somebody else who's doing those customizations but may not understand what they're developing? Who may, maybe they know a little bit of JavaScript, but they don't really. Okay. Let's do both. So let's talk about it for you first. So for me, after last week, I'm completely comfortable working in the SharePoint framework. I can honestly say that. And it wasn't a week. We really just did stuff for two days. Yeah, it was for two days. And and it was because the things that didn't work before, last time I played with it, they've addressed now. I was now more easily able to load external libraries, to load external style sheets, to get that script on the page and get it to function. I mean, the trick is knowing how to do it. Yeah. The trick is knowing how do you load an external script? How yeah, where's do you the decoder load? key? Right. What is that? Once you find that decoder key and you know which files you have to update... It's, you know, even though they use TypeScript, you can write JavaScript in there. Right. And it, and it actually does work. Yeah. Right? So I am confident after last week that I could take the SharePoint framework and do what I want to with it. So that's you doing that, right? And I mean, but someone else who's like hasn't done that and they had to, you know, kind of get ramped up and pick up a little bit on it. What do you think, like, about like somebody else like that you would come to customers you'd work with? Or some of the people that come to your sessions that you, that I think you were alluding to just a second ago, like, they sit down. First time you sit down at something, you're going to have a little bit of a challenge. Like, you know, how do I, how do you figure this out, right? How do you, how do you figure different pieces of it out? And every, how do you figure out the deployment model? How, where's this component loader that I need to go through and to load different things? And granted, there's going to be some stuff they're going to have to pick up, but how hard do you think, how big of a challenge do you think they're going to have? If they're not a developer, if they're truly one of these, let's change what the definition of citizen developer, if they're truly one of those things, uh-huh. they're not going to do it. I'm sorry, they don't have the skill set to do it. There's too many places you have to touch. There's too many things you have to understand at a core concept uh, in order to create a client web part or any of the other functionality coming in the SharePoint framework. You have to have some sort of knowledge of the underlying technologies and the ability to apply it. You're not going to be able to say, here, take my script and throw it in this content editor web part and you're good to go. It's going to be, in fact, I've got a blog post that goes through a video of customizing, of taking one of my customizations and moving it into the framework. And it's a, it's a multi-step process. So if you can follow all 8 to 12 steps and do it repeatedly, then you might be able to follow those directions, but I don't think you're going to be able to make any changes, again, unless you're someone who actually knows how to write code, knows what a semicolon is, right? right. So you can do, go through and do that stuff. It's a big, big change from that standpoint. I'm not a big fan of how they've laid out the projects and everything. I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of how they've done... You, you go to create a web part and you got the sidecar manifest JSON file. I think that there's a better way for them to do that and make it a little bit easier to understand. The way that you know they've got seven or eight different config files that... It's a little intimidating when you see all these different config files and you realize that you know I, there's only one that I need to mess with, but I can also you know, probably chop it down quite a bit and bring them down to one and have one for like you know deployment stuff and one for like packaging stuff. It seems like they could have changed that up. That's good feedback. Gave it to them. I actually gave a couple proposals on what I on how I would change it. If I had the keys to the kingdom and I was the if I was the PM, how would I actually do the project structure? I mean, I gave them. I told them here's how I would do it. Now, do you think that that's a lot? That that's what's going to trip people up? Like if if you we're able to kind of say, forget about 80% of the stuff that's here in the project. You really don't need it. And instead, you just need to spend a little bit of time focusing on, here's the TypeScript file that you use to go through and build your web part. Here's the JSON file that you need to modify for when you go to deploy stuff and everything. Do you think if they were able to have, have that kind of stuff dumbed down for them, not dumbed down for them, excluded and kind of you know, simplified stuff, do you think that that makes it easier? Or do you think it doesn't change, or it doesn't change the story enough to where it's still you still say the same thing? I think it changes the story for new people, new developers, to get into the framework so they can get to work faster. I still don't think it changes the story for those. I'm using air quotes against citizen developers because a lot of those people are going to my blog, copying and pasting scripts. They don't know what it does at all, and they're getting it to work, and they're very happy about that. Like, oh, look what I'm able to do without knowing how to write code. But then what they do is they take scripts from three different blogs and throw them on the same page, and then email me because it doesn't work yeah. because they don't know what they're doing yeah. and i think those people and there's thousands and thousands of them yeah. will there's just they don't they don't have the necessary skills or experience to use the sharepoint framework you think if it's anything that if it's if i see a script if i want to go implement something on my site if i see the script i can copy it drop a content web, web part on the page drop it into there and it just works that's the bar that's the bar you're trying to hit because if it's anything like no no no, no. you're going to need to go open up an, an editor, you need to go create a project, 
you're going to need to go paste this stuff in. And even just pasting it in and saving it. So let's say there was no changes you had to make. You just, like, yo, at Microsoft Flash SharePoint, go through all that stuff, take the script from your blog, copy, paste it in, do gulp serve, see it work. Do you think that bar is too big? Given the structure and its curse, it, I'm not trying to challenge you. I'm just trying to, I'm just curious what you think here. I'm going to say maybe because okay. it's not, it's not that. It's getting the development environment set up correctly first. Oh, that's fair. Right? That's and fair that's, point. that's going to be a big task. And the fact that, the fact, how are you going to make those, all those config changes when you got to have to add all the externals, right? That's, how are you going to get all that stuff into one file? I don't see it. And, but that's not who the audience is for the SharePoint framework. It's, you know, when I tell people that if you really don't want to use the SharePoint framework, I've had people come up to me panicked at this conference about it, frankly. If, if you don't want to use it, there's that link. Return to Classic View, right? Click the link. Stay in Classic. Or use the web part that Michael Svensson came out, which is the, the modern script editor web part. Right, exactly. Pay some JavaScript in and runs on the page. Yep. So there's already been a client web part created that does exactly what a content editor web part does. Just use that instead. Yeah. It's a pretty straightforward thing. It just gives you a little, just gives you some other stuff there. And it makes people's heads at Microsoft spin <laughs> thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they don't like it, but I mean, it's like, you know, we're here to get our job done. Here. I knew That's someone what... was going to do it. I'm yeah, just yeah. like, if it hadn't been him, it could have been me, but I'm at least, you know, yeah. at least that target's off my back now, so thanks. Well, you can have a thing in there where you have maybe an option just to check it off. I need to include jQuery in it. knows how to inject jQuery in the page, and you don't have to worry so much about it. I like that. you go. I'm not going to publish this for a week or two. You got some time, <laughs> but. <laughs> so I got um, another question for you then. So when you're doing your stuff, and I mean, I'm a, I am a big fan when I do this stuff of anything, I want to have all of my deployments automated. I want to know that when I'm building stuff, it works locally. I know that when I check it in or when I commit it to like the dev branch and I push it up to GitHub or wherever, that that triggers a build in Circle and Circle runs all my tests. And then if all that's good, if I did it on master, then it knows how to package it up and push it out somewhere. I'm always striving for that for any of the stuff I'm building because it just makes, I think it makes life so much easier. It's a little bit harder to set up on the front side, but it makes my life easier. So. What do you think about all that? Is that is that? And I know that you know not you, that when you say content or web part, that a lot of customers won't go in that direction. But what I'm curious is like, how much would you want to strive to get to that point to try and do those kinds of things and put that stuff, try and do that, try and put that stuff up? Like, do you want to? Do you want to, stuff to get that? Spot? No, no, it would it would be I would I would love to have a low friction way of doing just that to have some approach because you said there's a lot of upfront work here that I'll set up. There's a hand. I mean, I think that once you do it, like. I haven't done it so much with the SharePoint Framework project just yet, right? But I want to spend some time and get it set up. Like I have it set up for a JavaScript library that I maintain, the ng Office UI fabric, and I have it all set up. And it took me about a day or two to figure it out. But now that I know how to do it, it's going to be a piece of cake to go through and do it a second time. So or how long? Else. I mean, that's, the, that's the question. How long would it take you to think? I, well, right now, I don't know. I mean, with, with the SharePoint Framework side, I don't know. Because I think that I could probably have a pattern done for the SharePoint Framework relatively quick. I think I could probably have one done and maybe, I probably have it done in less in about a day, just to try and figure it out. And once that's done the first time, like that's the first one for every project after that. Because like the way the way that I look at it is, I love to have a way to where I can build all stuff, it all looks good, ta da da, fantastic. All right, push it into dev, and then I push that, out, I, that dev goes, when I, when I push the, I commit it to dev, and then I push it up to my dev branch, that kicks off a build process. The build process goes through all the stuff that we do locally, runs through all the tests, make sure all those work, and if everything's good, it's got the information in there about how to package it up and how to push everything out to the CDN. We've already got all the code set up for that, the gulp test for that, right? Push everything out to the CDN, and then we just didn't have to have a way to take what that artifact that was done and push it over into the app catalog and update this stuff. Those are the ALM libraries that we don't have, or maybe the ALM REST APIs that we don't have access to right now, or sorry, that are not available yet. But it could at least build that artifact and put it somewhere where I can easily go download it and you know push it out from there. And so instead of me having to do the manual stuff on my side, it's a better story that way. I think that I could set that up in about a day. And once I had that done, replicating it for other projects, I think would be very, very simple. It's one config file that I drop in the root of the project. It's going into, for me, I like to use Circle for my um, continuous integrations. So I go Circle, hook it up to this one project on the dev branch and say, go. And maybe a couple of config things like, you know, where's my Azure storage blob and all this kind of stuff, but does it all for you. So I think any real developer, development shop should strive for that, absolutely, right? Um, I think it'd be a great course. If I only knew somebody who could write a course that would teach me how to do that. I love how you plug me. You plug my stuff every time you talk. <laughs> every time I put a mic in front of you, you always do that. I appreciate it. <laughs> but I'm serious, right? It's like, okay, it's, it's, it sounds great. 
teach me to do it. Yeah. Right? I'll do that. Okay. I will do that. Oh, cool. Is there anything else that you wanted to share with our listeners? It's been it's been a long time since we've been we talked about doing this, and I've wanted to sit down with you. I I love this style of development more. I love the agility of it. I love the I like it because I like the fact that I like TypeScript, I like JavaScript, and I like the fact that I'm doing the same kind of development in the client that I'm doing on the server side development as well with using like Node and stuff to stand up a web server and everything. I'm writing the same code. I'm using the same test harnesses. I'm using the same test framework. I'm using the same build tasks and stuff. I absolutely love it. And it just feels like I don't have that context switch like I have in other places. Okay. I guess, so here's, if I had some parting words for people, it would be, um, I think you're the person who told me this. It, don't let the, if you're going to the SharePoint framework, don't let the tool set bog you down. Don't yeah. get don't get caught up in what all, because there's a lot of change there. Don't get caught up in that. What would you focus on? Focus on training. No, 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 no. I mean like on the tool chain. On the tool chain? Yeah, yeah. What parts of the tool chain would you focus on? There's Gulp, Webpack, right. Node, TypeScript, NPM. I think I would concentrate, this is coming from somebody who hasn't gone deep into any of those, right? Okay. So I'm, I'm your ideal test case. That's why I'm asking you So this. tell me if I'm wrong. Is this, a, this could be a wrong There's answer. no wrong answer. Right? NPM. Okay, that's because, what I would say the same thing. Because you've got to learn how to update your packages. You've got to learn how to figure out which versions you're on and, and control all those node modules. So I think, I think in my ignorant state of mind, I would, I'm going to say NPM if you're going to concentrate on one that's of those. That's one of the ones that I, that I yes. tell people to focus on. Sweet. Do you get any more? Really, I don't. I mean, because so, so me is me is TypeScript. So okay, that this is the thing. So I'm, I'm going to try for as long as possible, as I learn SharePoint framework, to bring my audience along with me. And my audience are those content editor web part hacks. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to try to bring those guys with me into the SharePoint framework. I've made this as my personal goal. I don't know if I'll succeed or not, mm -hmm. but part of that is going to be me not learning TypeScript for as long as possible. Okay. Because they say you don't need to. Yeah. I agree it would make your life easier if you did. But I want to push that envelope, and I want to say, here's what you can do without learning TypeScript. And then from here, if you want to, I urge you to learn it, just like I'm going to urge people to learn React, because all of those examples out there are in React, but I am, not, I am going to pivot away from those tools to get to the purity of JavaScript development with the SharePoint framework. Cool. Awesome. Mark? Our battery lasted. I was a little concerned about it till the very end here, but uh, thank you very much for sitting down and talk to our listeners about this. I know I'm interested to see what kind of feedback they have from this. I know this is a hot button issue with a lot of people on how they do development and everything, and so I'm glad that we were able to get you on the show and talk about this. I already. appreciate you having me. Maybe I'll come back someday if, you, if, if, if the audience doesn't hate it too much. Well, we like it so they can listen again. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed that interview that I sat down with Mark Rackley. I love talking to Mark about some of a lot of this developer stuff. I, he's a very good developer. He's got a really interesting perspective on a lot of this stuff too. And it's funny to kind of watch people in the community or some more, I guess what you would consider like server side developers look at a lot of the stuff that like what Mark Rackley does. And you'd say like, you know, God, it's not, is it real development? You know, you're not using real source control and, you know, testing and all that kind of stuff when, and, you know, when it comes down to it, you know, what's he doing? He's solving the customer's requirements and he's just getting the job done. So that's always important. It's always what you're looking for. So with that, before I do picks, I just want to call one thing out here. Hey, in a couple of weeks, we're on episode 191 right now. God, it's crazy. We've done 191 episodes. We are coming up now in about nine weeks, maybe a little bit less, to episode 200 for the show. CJ and I are playing with a couple different ideas on things that we're going to put in the show. We've been running this thing for almost three and a half years now. Or actually, it's been about three and a half years now. And we got 200 episodes, weekly episode. We've only missed a couple weeks here and there. And uh, I really hope you guys are enjoying this. I mean, I guess if you're listening to this, you probably are enjoying it. Or otherwise, you would have unsubscribed by now. But... If you would like to, you know, shout out and throw something at the at the show, maybe record a, a quick little, you know, congratulations or, you know, what you get out of the show, we'd love to play some of those things for everybody on the show. And, you know, just what has this show meant for you? What have you gotten out of it? What have you enjoyed? Have you not enjoyed it? What are some of your funniest moments or favorite episodes? You could always go through and, you know, send something on a, just a text or some, or send us a message as a tweet or go to our site and leave a comment in the show notes or on the, the contact form that we have on the page. But if you would, take a second and, you know, pull your phone out and record a little, you know, message to us. Introduce yourself real quick and post it up to Dropbox or someone and somewhere and then, you know, send us a link to that so we can play it on the air. We'd love to, you know, have a compilation of what some people's favorite episodes were and favorite guests. Worst guest, how's that? Worst guest, worst interviews, 
worst show that AC did, worst show that CJ did, maybe best shows too, hopefully. And yeah, just you know, throw something out. Let's make it fun. We got some ideas of what we want to do with episode 200, but I'd really like to make it more of a show for you guys and, and a show for all the, the men and women out there that, that enjoy this show. Be a part of it. For, you know, jump on and be a part of it. We'd love to hear from you. Okay, so with that, I want to take a minute here and let's do some picks. So my first pick is actually going to be a new podcast. Two guys that have actually been on the show before, Ben Stedjink and Scott Hogue, have been on the show one or two times a piece. And uh, I know we talked to them about some automation stuff too uh, a couple weeks ago, or actually uh, late last year. They have started a podcast called the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast. CJ and I generally focus on dev stuff and geeky, you know, stuff like that. A lot of dev oriented type things. But these guys are want to focus on it more from the IT pro side. I mean, CJ and I try and cover that sometimes, but I mean, let's face it, that's not our, our sweet spot. So I've encouraged Ben and, and uh, Scott, you know, hey, you guys stand up a show and, you know, heck the name, use the same name we got, Microsoft Cloud Show or Microsoft Cloud Podcast or whatever. So they just put IT pro in the name. So they are at the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast. You'll find them in iTunes. You'll find them in the Google Play Store. It's msclouditpropodcast.com or check your email. If you're a subscriber to the show, you will get an email with the show notes in it and that link as well as it'll also be in the notes in the app where you're downloading the show and listening to it on your phone and in the earbuds. My second pick is a site called Rap API. Rap API allows you, there's a, a community free version, there's a, a commercial version, and then there's even an enterprise edition. And basically what this does is it allows you to, using their browser-based tool and their Chrome extension, to create an API, a REST API from data that you find online. So the demo that they show in the little video is using uh, Reddit, so that they go to a, a Reddit page or a subreddit, and they are able to, uh, using a kind of a drag and drop kind of approach, select elements on the page, pull the title, pull the link, pull maybe the, the number of comments, all that stuff out and create an RSS feed, or sorry, create a JSON feed, a REST API or a REST feed out of that data. You can even set it up to where you can, you know, how to go page, you know, multiple pages of data and all that kind of stuff. It's really slick. It's pretty cool. The, the free version is all public endpoints that anybody can use. The first commercial version has a little more support, a little more performance, and allows you to have private endpoints that you don't want to share with anybody. So you can think lots of different sites are really good for this, just going, you know, scraping data from a, a site, but turning it into a REST API, and you do it with no code. They do it all with regular expressions, but you don't have to deal with the regular expressions. They make it really easy. You can deal with regular expressions if you want. My third pick is a Chrome extension that I found uh, actually today. I found it this morning. I saw it on Hacker News, and um, I've already installed it and started playing with it. It's pretty slick. It's called Tamper. So what it allows you to do is once you install it inside of Chrome, it adds a new tab inside your developer tools, and it allows you to intercept and to either redirect or to inspect and modify and replay HTTP requests specifically things like around XHR requests, and it even can trap post messages between two different post messages happening on the same site. So there's a, uh, I'll put the link to it in the show notes. I'd encourage you, if, you don't, if you're not really sure you know, too much about this, go to the link in the show notes. It takes you to the Google Chrome web store where you can see this extension, but click on the, on the link for the extension and go to the GitHub page. The README has a lot of screenshots showing you how it works and everything. It's really slick. I'm really impressed by it. I've got it installed. I love it. The only thing I don't like about it so far is another bug that someone else found, which is it doesn't work if you have your Chrome developer tools using the dark theme instead of the, the default white theme. If it's a dark theme, nothing shows up. So all the text is all black on black. So it doesn't help so much. All right. Well, that does it for the show this week. Hope everybody enjoyed the show. Hope nobody missed CJ. Maybe people did miss CJ. CJ, I miss you, man. And um, CJ will be back next week, and we will be talking to you then. Thanks a lot, everybody. Did you like this episode? Please tweet about it and drop a five-star review in iTunes. Word of mouth recommendations are the most effective ways for us to grow the show, and we'd really appreciate it. 
If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a wave or an MP3 and provide a link so that we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is brought to you by Keith Ritchie. For more information on Keith's music, head to music.kritchie.com. You can subscribe to us in iTunes and the Google Play Store by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find notes of each episode. You can also find us on Facebook, searching for Microsoft Cloud Show, or on Twitter, at MS Cloud Show. And finally, sign up to our mailing list by heading over to our website and entering your email to interact with us, participate in upcoming interviews, and other cool stuff. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.